the 1918 German Navy mutiny. Boiler stokers probably dream of a lot of things when they are not sweating over the fires and the bowels of their ships, but probably never of attaining the majestic office of Admiral of the Fleet, which ranks as a million times less likely than their winning first prize in the Calcutta sweep. Yet in November 1918, a German stoker, Bernard Kunt, rose straight from the stokehold to supreme command of the German high sea fleet, deposing the haughty sea lord, Admiral von Hipper. To complete this coming to life of a stoker's dream, Kunt retained Admiral von Hipper as his technical advisor. The occasion was a wild naval mutiny in the last stages of the Great War of 1914-18 that lasted five days and drove the last nail in Kaiser Wilhelm II's hopes of victory. The German General Ludendorff had planned to prolong the carnage for at least another winter, but after this final abasement of Germany's arms by men of her own fleet, Kaiser Bill tarried not upon his going but went at once, quitting his throne and scuttling like a cowardly rabbit to a private funk hole in neutral Holland. Trouble had been brewing in the German Navy since the beginning of 1917 when famine followed a bitter winter. Rotten potatoes were supplemented by herb tea, turnips, dehydrated vegetables and monotonous bowls of thin vegetable soup and to help down their black bread the men were issued with ersatz, marmalade made from crushed turnips artificially coloured and flavoured. Reduction of the soap ration in April 1917 proved the last straw for the stokers. Blackened with oil and coal dust after their day's work, they were expected to clean themselves with three small cakes of soap a month. While the 25,000 ton fleet flagship Friedrich de Grosse was exercising at sea, Stokers led by a 22-year-old petty officer, Willie Sachs, refused duty until harassed officers promised to restore the soap issue to its former scale. To save face, the captain ordered all stokers to line up for inspection after washing to ensure that the soap had really been used, not carried ashore to trade to women. As a consequence, men had to stand naked for long periods while being subjected to a thorough but leisurely inspection. Inflammatory socialist propaganda from ashore urged sailors to follow the example of their revolutionary comrades in Russia, who in the previous month had forced the Tsar to abdicate and seize the Russian fleet. Hoping to placate the seamen, the government authorised them to appoint a messing committee aboard each ship. These committees usually contained at least one wireless operator whose position naturally placed him in contact with socialist propaganda ashore, and they quickly became socialist cells that took their orders from Sachs. Events were brought to a head by the murder of harsh, unpopular Captain Thorbeck of the battleship Koenig Albert on the night of July 25th, 1917. Returning by gig to his ship after bibulous celebrations ashore, Thorbeck was fumbling uncertainly for the man ropes when there was a brief scuffle, a splash, and a loud shout, Herr Kapitän ist überbord! The swift current swept the body away, but when the bloated corpse was recovered several days later, it was found to have a deep knife wound in the back. Unrest increased, and the commander-in-chief, Admiral Scheer, decided to send the fleet to sea to keep the men occupied. Sabotage, strikes, and mass walkouts delayed the sailing, and led to widespread arrests. Many of the offenders were imprisoned aboard the battleship Prince Regent Leitpold, already known as the convict ship because of the rigid discipline enforced in her. On August the 2nd, the Prince Regent Leitpold sailed to the fleet anchorage at Schillig Roads, but rumour had it she would be put to sea so that the prisoners could be dealt with summarily by the captain. Sachs summoned his inner junta to a meeting at the Tivoli Café in Kiel, on the following evening and plans were made for direct action. At noon next day the high sea fleet went on strike and mutineers aboard the battleship Kaiserin blockaded their officers in the wardroom and looted the ship's stores. The Friedrich de Grosser was ordered to Schillig Roads. At 9.50am Sachs, 
who was on watch and had charge of the switchboard and public address system, ordered stokers to draw the ship's fires. All four stoke holds were blanketed in clouds of hissing steam as hoses were played on white hot coals raked in onto the steel deck. Hurrying below to investigate, the captain was met by demands that prisoners aboard the Prince Regent Litpold should be released immediately and the Seamen's Committee should have the right to confer with him personally on matters affecting the crew's welfare. Admiral Shear acted promptly and firmly. Wholesale jail sentences were handed out to more than 300 sailors. Two of the ringleaders were executed by firing squad, and Sachs was sentenced to 15 years imprisonment with hard labour. A year later, however, the simmering cauldron of discontent boiled over under Admiral von Hipper, who assumed command of the fleet after Scheer had been promoted Chief of the Naval Staff. The collapse of Bulgaria in September 1918 left a dangerous gap in Germany's eastern defences, and peace feelers were put out to President Wilson. Despite Scheer's strong opposition, it was decided to end the unrestricted submarine campaign as a placatory measure, and all submarines were ordered to return to home waters. With some 130 unemployed U-boats at his disposal, Scheer planned a last blow to cripple the Allied Grand Fleet based at Scarpa Flow. He proposed to concentrate his submarine force in the North Sea, then take a final sortie into the Channel with his entire battle fleet at the end of the month, when the Allied Grand Fleet, which had been waiting two and a half years for a chance to engage the German High Sea Fleet in battle, hurried south to meet the challenge. She had planned to order von Hipper to retire and draw the Allied warships into the deadly cordon of submarines lurking in wait. On October 18th, Scheer secured the Kaiser's approval of the plan, and a week later the submarines put to sea. Close secrecy was observed, but as soon as the fleet began to prepare for action, the sailors realised battle was imminent. They had no intention of going on a death or glory campaign with the end of the war in sight, and the Revolutionary Committee issued a general order to the men. It is intended to force an engagement in which ships will be sacrificed for the sake of honourable defeat, ran the order. That means death for tens of thousands of our comrades. It will also hinder the government's peace negotiations. Ships must be prevented from putting to sea under any circumstances. Battle orders issued by von Hipper on the evening of October 29 resulted in an immediate refusal of duty by crews aboard seven of the nine capital ships. However, some form of discipline was restored, and late the following night the battleships Turingen and Heligoland were detailed to lead the fleet from Schillig Roads. Acting on previously prepared plans, stokers aboard both ships immediately raked out the furnaces and doused the blazing coals. Fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting broke out as officers and other loyalists tried to restrain the mutineers. Some were cut down with viciously wielded shovels, while others were felled with jagged lumps of coal. Dynamos were smashed with sledgehammers, and in the resultant darkness mutineers on deck seized compartments under the forecastle through which the anchor chains passed and put the capstans out of action making it impossible for the two battleships to weigh anchor. At daylight, two transports escorted by a destroyer and the submarine U-135 stood in towards the rebel ships. Through the scuttles, mutineers could see the transports' decks crowded with marines whose blue steel bayonets glinted in the morning sun. Mutineers brought three of the Heligoland's six-inch guns to bear on the approaching convoy, but a party of officers countered this by manning the Turingan's after turret and swinging its battery of giant 12-inch guns to bear on the Heligoland. Their ace trumped. The mutineers made no attempt to fire, and as soon as troops boarded her, the Heligoland's rebels surrendered. The Turingan's men for a time refused to leave the blockaded compartment on the four-gun deck, but they hastily capitulated when the U-135's twin torpedo tubes were aimed at a point immediately below their shelter, and the destroyer ran up the Z pennant as a signal she was ready to open fire. However, 500 prisoners taken ashore from the two battleships won the escort over to their side and were allowed to escape. 
After their departure, the captain of the Turingen made a last appeal to the remainder of his crew. Let us fire our two thousand shells to the last one, he urged, and sink with the flag flying. The men replied to this glory in death appeal that they were not emphatically interested. Alarmed at the turn of events, the German government ordered the warships to be dispersed to Kiel and Wilhelmshaven. Here sailors held mass meetings, paraded through the streets and stripped officers of their weapons and medals. Rallies demanding immediate peace and abdication of the Kaiser culminated on November 3rd in a march of 20,000 men to free mutineers imprisoned in Wald Wiesen barracks. Outside the prison, a Lieutenant Steinhauser, heading a small party of submarine veterans, called on the formidable procession to halt. When his command was ignored, he ordered his men to fire a volley over the heads of the demonstrators. The next volley killed eight of their leaders and wounded thirty more. The fire was promptly returned, with interest, and most of the prison's defenders were killed. Stabbed in the back, Steinhauser fell, and the mob surged on to free their comrades. Kunt became leader of the mutineers after revolutionaries in Kiel and Wilhelmshaven had united to elect a president of the Republic of Oldenburg and Ostfriesland. Within five days, all Germany became a republic when the Kaiser fled to Holland, in the face of nationwide uprisings, and two days afterwards the armistice was signed. As self-proclaimed commander of the High Seas Fleet, Kunt ordered all vessels to fly the red flag in place of the Imperial Ensign. A Captain Winninger aboard the battleship Koenig Albert refused to obey. With sword drawn, he stood guard over the halyards until he crumpled to the deck under a hail of bullets. For one week only, the world's second largest fleet was in rebel hands. After the armistice, the Allies' refusal to treat with the mutineers led to the recall of the admirals and other deposed officers to whom fell the distasteful task of handing over their once proud navy to the British.